Hello and welcome to the British Broadcasting Century. I'm Paul Carenza. As this episode lands, it's November the 14th, 2021. That's the 99th birthday of the BBC. Happy birthday, Auntie Beeb. So what better time than to bring you the story so far of the British Broadcasting Century podcast, 36 or so episodes condensed into half an hour for you. Or 45 minutes. That's the problem with recording the intro first. Now, a version of this has previously played out on the History of England podcast, but firstly, they're not keeping it there forever, so we had to preserve it here too. And secondly, if you've heard that one already, I've added several new bits, some lovely choice audio morsels, and there are even one or two completely brand new bits of archive I wanted to bring you. On the British Broadcasting Century. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling... This is London Calling. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling. The British Broadcasting Century podcast now embarks on a short series of specials between seasons two and three of the podcast. Yes, before we enter 1923 and experience the first full year of the BBC, let's go back and see the story so far on this special, the prehistory of the BBC. Can you hear anything? Distinctly, Mr Marconi. There may be some jamming. They said, would you come? They want a girl's voice. It was a great adventure to broadcast, of course. One moment, please, while we move the piano. There may be some oscillation. Whew! So the BBC's just turned 99. When the BBC turns 100 exactly a year from now, you can join me at the Museum of Comedy, a fantastic venue right in the heart of London. I'll be putting on my one-man play, The First Broadcast, about Peter Eckersley and Arthur Burroughs dueling for the very soul of British broadcasting before the BBC even begins. Google Museum of Comedy, the first broadcast, to find information about booking tickets for that play. And indeed, if you have a venue somewhere around the country throughout 2022, I'm hoping to bring that play all over the land. So do get in touch if you'd like to book it in at your place. Current venues include Guildford, Surbiton, Leicester, and a few others I can't quite tell you about yet. But that's 2022. Let's go back in time 100 years then and see the story of British broadcasting. And it begins, of course, with Marconi. Listen to this, Kemp. Take the headphone. Marconi himself appearing on the BBC in 1936, playing himself in a reconstruction of when he first sent Morse code across the Atlantic in 1901. Can you hear anything? Yes, there it is. The letter S. Distinctly, Mr Marconi. Peg it. Peg it. Come here and listen. Those are actually Marconi's last recorded words before he died, there with his assistants Paget and Kemp, although Kemp there was played by an actor. They're recreating the moment when they sent Morse code from Poldhu in Cornwall to Newfoundland over 2,000 miles away. Prior to that, 255 miles was the wireless record. Marconi was always outdoing himself. As a teenager, he would send radio waves across his bedroom, a transmitter and a receiver ringing a bell. And then outside, he'd ask his assistant across a field to fire a gunshot if the wireless signal reached him. And then transmitting over water. And then in 1896, the 21-year-old Marconi came to England. The Italian army weren't interested in his new invention, so he thought that he would try the influential engineers of London. I think it's that decision that set London and the BBC as the beating heart of broadcasting a couple of decades later. There was a magical moment where Marconi strode into Toynbee Hall in East London with two boxes and they communicated wirelessly. And he simply said, my name is Guglielmo Marconi and I have just invented wireless. Well, that is a drop mic moment if they had a mic to drop at that stage. Others played with this technology. In December 1906, Canadian inventor Reginald Fessenden managed to make a very faint speech broadcast for ships near Brant Rock, Massachusetts, making the first entertainment show for radio. He played a record, Handel's Largo, he played O Holy Night on violin, and read from Luke's Gospel, Chapter 2. Well, it was Christmas Eve. And that was actually my way into this whole story of radio and wireless and communications like this. I wrote a book a few years ago on the history of Christmas. It was called Hark, the Biography of Christmas. And I researched Reginald Fessenden's Christmas entertainment broadcast and also the first BBC Christmas of 1922. And I read that then the Beeb had 35,000 listeners at that point, but only four employees. I had to know who these four employees were. 
And I love that this medium of podcasting owes so much to those early radio pioneers. Now, I'm no engineer. For me, it's all about the characters. Marconi, yes, he was one of those characters. And through the 1910s, business was booming for Marconi and indeed the Marconi Company. He still saw radio, though, as a two-way thing. You know, we radio for help. Marconi took the credit for radio's use in catching criminals like Dr. Crippen, who'd escaped on a ship across the ocean, and saving lives on board Titanic. Soon every major vessel carried radios and a Marconi operator for a fee, of course. SOS are broadcasting services, we could say. Professor Gabriel Balby of USI in Switzerland, where he's Associate Professor of Media Studies. So there is from one point, one boat which is in danger to the other boats close to this one. But at the end of the day, Marconi uh, had always the same problem, how to make people pay for this service. And if this service is free and can be picked up by everybody, this is not a service interesting to him. But SOS could be considered a form of early Mm -hmm. broadcasting. He made his money in sending messages the world over between two people. The broadcast aspect was an accident. It was a pitfall of radio being too leaky, really. So the first listeners were actually called listeners in. The messages were not intended for them. So it was at a more amateur level, the radio hams who would be experimenting with broadcasting. And it was really them who demanded some sense of broadcasting, even though there wasn't a word for it at that point. Britain's first DJ, technically, was a woman called Gertrude Donisthorpe in World War I. Her husband, Horace, was the eager experimenter of the couple. He was an army wireless trainer by day. At night, the couple would cycle to a field near Worcester. He would set up on one side, she would be on the other, and she would play records and recite rhymes just for her audience of one, her husband, to see if it had worked. She'd cycle across the field to see if it had, often finding that he had cycled off to tell her via a different route. And as their wireless experiments progressed there in the middle of the Great War, they started transmitting limited wireless concerts for some local troops. And they were popular. Radio amateurs enjoyed what they heard when they could hear it. There was demand for wireless entertainment, just not much supply. But the engineers, like those at the Marconi Company, were continually strengthening and improving the technology. Marconi's right-hand man, Captain H.J. Round, for example... I was fortunate enough to get taken on as a junior engineer with the Marconi Company. I was strongly advised against this step on my part by my college professors. And among scientists generally at that time, there were many attempts at debunking Marconi's efforts. Actually, the scientists missed the boat. And my voyage on that boat during the following 35 years was like one wonderful dream with hardly a moment without some new phenomena or some new success to thrill one. That's a rare clip of Captain Round himself, one of the great geniuses of wireless technology who eventually gave us radar and sonar, as well as giving a helping hand to radio itself. Bit of a Churchill lookalike, round face, cigars and no nonsense. And he was a complete genius. He was designing radios, but especially focusing on installing radios in aircraft. That, of course, helped in World War I and in civil aviation when it started soon after. Captain Round is a name we will come back to. After the war, 1919, just months before the birth of broadcasting, the Marconi Company still had no real interest at all in radio as an art form or entertainment or anything other than point-to-point messaging that they would be paid for. Apart from one person in the Marconi Company, their head of publicity, Arthur Burroughs. Nobody could tell to what extent broadcasting would catch on, nor indeed whether it would take on at all. There was no precedent, no store of experience to be tapped, There was a man, Arthur Burroughs, that worked for the Marconi Company starting from the beginning of the 1910s. He had a kind of different vision, a different culture, we could also say, because he came from a newspaper culture. So this man wrote one memorandum to the Marconi Company uh, telling the the management, uh, look, why don't we do something that today we could call radio? In 1918, Burroughs wrote these words. There appears to be no serious reason why, before we are many years older, politicians speaking, say, in Parliament should not be heard simultaneously by wireless in the reporting room of every newspaper office in the United Kingdom. The same idea might be extended to make possible the correct reproduction in all private residences of Albert Hall or Queen's Hall concerts. There would be no technical difficulty in the way of an enterprising advertisement agency arranging for the interval in the musical programme to be filled with audible advertisements on behalf of somebody's or tomato ketchup. 
Around the same time in America, future radio mogul David Sarnoff sent a memo referring to a radio music box, an idea that listeners in could have in their homes, playing the music broadcast by wireless stations. Broadcasting is sending messages to the, the greatest number of people possible. It was completely counter uh, the, the business. And the Marconi company rejected the memoranda of Artaburus. Marconi ultimately admitted that Burroughs had it right all along when he wrote the foreword to Arthur Burroughs' book in 1924, two years after the BBC was born. Marconi wrote, I am pleased that Mr Burroughs, who made early and singularly correct predictions and who has been so intimately associated with this popular application of wireless science, has placed on the record the story of broadcasting from its inception. In Britain, Captain Round of the Marconi Company continued to experiment, and he switched his attention from using radio to find enemy ships to using radio to transmit the human voice further and stronger than ever before. And that meant tests. Now, the nature of radio, the quirk of it, is that it's not private. You can't experiment without anyone with a set listening in. Since the war, there were more and more ex-wireless operators and amateur radio hams. So as Captain Round experimented in Chelmsford at the end of 1919 with his assistant William Ditcham, across Britain and even into Europe, people could hear his tests. William Ditcham had to read out something into his microphone. It was just the candlestick part of an old telephone. So Ditcham would begin, MZX calling, MZX calling. This is the Marconi valve transmitter in Chelmsford, England, testing on a wavelength of 2,750 metres. How are our signals coming in today? Can you hear us clearly? I will now recite to you my usual collection of British railway stations for test purposes. The Great Northern Railway starts at King's Cross, London. The Midland Railway starts from St Pancras. The Great Western Railway starts from... Yeah, so railway timetables. They were a massive hit. Word spread. Literally. Letters to newspapers said how much these radio amateurs were enjoying Mr Ditcham and Round's wireless experiments, but the content could do with being a little bit more exciting. How about if he read a newspaper? And so in January 1920, William Ditcham became our first broadcast newsreader, literally reading the news from a paper he bought that morning. Well, he would sit on it for a day and read yesterday's paper because the press might have a problem with their copyrighted news being given away for free. And thus begins the rocky relationship between broadcasters and the press. It is worth keeping journalists on your side. In January 1920, there were two weeks of Ditcham's news service. That's Britain's first programme title, really. And that gains over 200 reports from listeners in as far as Spain, Portugal and Norway up to 1,500 miles away. And so the transmitter is replaced because these are, of course, experiments about strength. From 6 kilowatts to 15 kilowatts, now they can go further, stronger, clearer. Mr Ditcham ups his game as well. He throws in a gramophone record or two just to see how music comes across. He starts doing 15 minutes of news and then 15 minutes of music, a half hour in total. That seems like a good length for a programme. Really, it was just what the licence allowed. But it has clearly stuck, at least until Netflix and the like mean that programme length is no longer necessarily half an hour. It's become a little bit more variable a century later. Then in February 1920, live music appears. Just a few fellow staff of Ditchman Rounds at the Marconi Works in Chelmsford. It includes Mr White on piano, Mr Beaton on oboe, Mr Higby on woodwind. At Marconi HQ in London... Arthur Burroughs, that publicity director who wrote of possible wireless concerts and catch-up sponsors, he gets behind this in a big way. He heads to Chelmsford, he supports Ditcham and Round and even joins the band. And you know who else joins the band? Well, from the neighbouring works building, Hoffman's Ball Bearings, there's a singer, Miss Winifred Sayer. They said, would you come? They want a girl's voice. And so I said, yes, if you like. So I went and... uh, I didn't know anything about it at all. It wasn't, you know, just going for for the fun of the thing. It was deadly serious. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, it was deadly serious. As she's not a Marconi employee, she must be paid. So she becomes radio's first professional entertainer. We got ten shillings each night. And I thought that was marvellous. <laughs> I thought, well, to tell you the truth, I thought it was an easy ten shillings. <laughs> 
previous broadcasts had been a little luck of the draw. But this one, well, it would be nice to tell people that it's going to happen rather than have them happen upon it if they are listening. So Captain Round sends out the first listings, the pre-radio times, the times you can hear radio, in this case hearing Winifred Sayer and the band. 11am and 8pm, February 23rd until March 6th, 1920. And that memo goes out to all the Marconi land stations and ships at sea. The first song that Winifred sang was called Absent. As she left, the MD of Marconi's said to her, you have just made history. Then, a little while afterwards, I had a souvenir sent to me by Marconi's of that event. And they had asked for anybody who heard us to uh, let them know. When I looked in this book and I looked at the back, I saw there was a ship a thousand miles out to sea. Well, I couldn't believe that. And so we have radio, right? Is that it? End of story? Not so fast. No, the fun is just beginning. The press, you see, were worth keeping on sight, like I said. The Daily Mail got wind of this. Arthur Burroughs, that publicity chap and radio prophet, he became friends in the war with a guy called Tom Clark. He was at this point the editor of the Daily Mail. And the Mail loved a novelty. They would sponsor air races and car dashes and designer top hat competitions. Radio was right up there Fleet Street. Yes, I went there. But they would need a bigger singer than Winifred Sayer from Hoffman's Ball Bearings. They wanted to see how big an audience there would be for broadcasting. Is there an industry in this? And so the Daily Mail fund one of the world's biggest singers, Dame Nellie Melba of Peach Melba fame. She was over in England at the Albert Hall doing some shows. So for a thousand pounds, that's enough to buy a house, she came to Chelmsford. Outside broadcast didn't exist at the time, given the size of the kit, so Ditcham and Round prepared the Chelmsford Works building, an old shed. It did involve a small fire and a microphone made from an old cigar box and a hat rack. Arthur Burroughs gave Madame Melba a tour when they weren't quite ready for her yet. She took one look at the 450-foot radio mast and said, Young man, if you think I'm going to climb up there, you are greatly mistaken. <laughs> She broadcasts on June the 15th, 1920, and it's a huge hit, despite a shutdown just before she finished her last song. Uh, the third song, an intermediate bell bust on the panel. So Captain Round has to make her do it again without telling her of the shutdown problem. He just simply asks her for an encore. Madam Melba, the world is calling for more. She says, are they? Arthur Burroughs at this point now gives the opening and closing announcements instead of William Ditcham, because this has always been Burroughs' dream, broadcast radio concerts. He was the one voice in the 1910s to think that this could be a possibility. So what next? Well, it spanned Britain, it reached Madrid, parts of the Middle East could hear Melba, but it's too successful. The air ministry found that planes couldn't land during the concert. It was dominating the airwaves. And so despite a few extra professional concerts from Chelmsford that summer, opera stars like Lloyd's Melchior and Dame Clara Butt, the government step in and they shut all radio experiments down. Radio silence. For Arthur Burroughs, the dream is surely over. That's it for broadcasting. He finds himself at sea, literally, that summer, demonstrating radio to the press on the way to an international press event. But without government backing, journalists now see that radio might be a means to communicate newsroom to newsroom, nothing more. Ditcham's news and Melba's music seem to be all that broadcasting ever amounted to. But Arthur Burroughs uses his time on the ship to play a few records, requests for other ships. Again, trying to show that there could be some future in this broadcast radio. DJ Burroughs is playing songs like I Love a Lassie by Harry Lauder. I love a lassie, a bonny hill and lassie. If you seen her, you would fancy her. And Burroughs was a foxy man, let me say, to experiment this early broadcasting in the uh, Imperial Wireless Press Conference. There were journalists traveling from one side to the other of the Atlantic and they could enjoy this kind of service provided by wireless. So it's a kind of experimentation through journalists, which were an important uh, um, stakeholder at that time. But for 18 months, 
there's pretty much nothing. Radio amateurs and indeed Arthur Burroughs at Marconi, they petitioned the postmaster general in the government to reconsider. And finally, it works. Because while the ether had fallen silent in Britain, in America, radio is booming. It continued in Holland. One particular person who was Dutch, but of course his uh, programmes were receivable in Britain for in the early 20s. It's a guy called Hanzo Idzerda. And this is Gordon Bathgate, radio historian and author of Radio Broadcasting, A History of the Airwaves. We've not featured Gordon on the podcast yet. We will very soon. But here he tells us about the Dutch concerts of the early 20s. And he, he started off these uh, series of Sunday afternoon concerts in 1921. Uh, it's called the Courthouse Concerts, and announcements were made in Dutch, French and English. So it, it definitely was aimed for an international audience. And uh, the English wireless magazine collected money from fans in the UK, and Zerda received letters of support, special requests, and uh, even some cake from his fans. So uh, his international success grows and the English Daily Mail sponsors Zerda to make uh, English broadcasts, especially for UK listeners. Britain does not want to be left behind. So the government say, OK, you can have one radio station. The Marconi Company is granted a permit, but much to Burroughs' dismay, the job lands on the desk of another person I would like to introduce you to, Captain Peter Eckersley. I happened to be in the Marconi Company at the time, long, low hut for the long, low people. We were eventually appointed to do this thing called broadcasting. Now, Eckersley was with the designs department of the aircraft section of Marconi's, so his team had helped create air traffic control. Eckersley had been there in the war for the first ground-to-air wireless communication. Now in their spare time, his team in a muddy field in the village of Rittle in Essex, not far from Chelmsford, they would have to fit in this broadcasting malarkey in their spare time for an extra pound a show. Not a lot. It was odd. Radio amateurs wanted it. Burroughs, the Marconi publicity guy, he wanted it more than anyone. Eckersley and his team really couldn't give two hoots about it. In fact, they celebrated when the government had banned radio 18 months earlier, as finally the airwaves were clear for them and their serious work, instead of constant blinking opera from Chelmsford. But it's Eckersley's job to start Britain's first regular radio station. This is 2 Emma Talk, Rittle testing. This is 2 Emma Talk, Rittle testing. Hello, CQ. Hello. From February the 14th, 1920, for the first few weeks, it sounds pretty normal. They play gramophone records, chosen by Arthur Burroughs at head office. Burroughs has arranged a sponsorship deal, not with Ketchup, but with a gramophone company. They provide a player as long as the gramophone company is mentioned on air. But Peter Eckersley's team of boffins, they break that gramophone player. There was a live singer. The first song on the first regular broadcast radio show was The Floral Dance. Although the Times called it at the time only faintly audible. For five weeks, this continues. Bland introductions to records, a live singer or two. And Peter Eckersley, the man in charge, goes home every Tuesday night to hear this show that his crew is putting out live on the wireless. He doesn't stay. Until week six. There are moments in history when the world changes. His broadcasting historian, Tim Wonder. There was a moment in March 1920 when Winifred Sayer becomes the first lady of Singapore mm. Radio. June the 15th, 1920, Melba walks to the microphone and shows the world what is possible. Now it's Eckersley's turn in, in March 1922. At one time I stayed and had some dinner at the local. He joins them for a pre-show gin and fish and chips and more gin at the local pub. And then I sort of suddenly felt that perhaps this formality was a little bit much. He runs down the lane to the hut, reaches the microphone first, and Peter Eckersley starts talking. Hello CQ, hello CQ, this is two Emma Tuck, two Emma Tuck, this is two Emma Tuck calling. Eckersley talks. I'm afraid um, there's a bit of rather... Serious things have happened this evening. And talks. We did expect to uh, get uh, some rather famous singer. Well, she failed. Singers failed, you know. And talks. Oh, it's not going out at all. Are you quite sure? For heaven's sake, then connect it up. Well, it isn't. Oh, it is. Hello, CQ. Uh, this has all been going on. I'm sorry there was a big, a bit, bit understanding. A little bit of a technical hitch. 
Uh, yes, yes, you have them too, I know, aren't they awful? And mimics and carouses. Yes, the concert ended sad. He well, plays the, the fool, he plays gramophone records off centre or covered in jam. The strict licence from the government meant that you had to close down for three minutes in every ten to listen out for government messages that may be saying you have to stop broadcasting. But Eckersley does not shut down for three minutes. He overruns. Did you want a blast? I blast a whole lot. Over an hour later, he finally stops. And the next day, his team gather round him and tell him what he actually said. I said, oh, did I say that? Oh, my God. Oh, no, I didn't. No, did I really say that? Well, I expected a letter. I got one from head office, from Arthur Burroughs. Burroughs' dream of broadcasting had been dashed on the rocks by Eckersley, a man probably drinking on the rocks. It was very rebuking. But it was offset by a pile of postcards that said, Wonderful. Do it again. We loved it. And so we did it again. And we didn't take any notice of Arthur Burroughs. Burroughs was a lone voice against Eckersley's antics. And so the following Tuesday and every Tuesday in 1922, Peter Eckersley seized the mic again and again. Eckersley, whatever he could think of, he put on the radio. There may be some jamming. Bah, 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 bah. There may be some oscillation. Whew, but hang on, CQ. The Was Night of Grand Street? Opera has, has become famous. Hang Eckersley on, couldn't CQ. sing and he certainly yeah. couldn't play the piano. Oh, but he told his audience they were going to receive opera live from Rome, which was technically impossible in 1922. He brought outrageous comedy, the pre-goon goon show, 30 years ahead of its time. Eckersley is an amazing character. He always wore odd socks, sometimes odd shoes. He uh, used to ride a motorbike and sidecar on two wheels because the sidecar tyre was always flat. He had a toothbrush, clean his teeth, brush his eyebrows, comb his hair, brush his suit, clean his shoes, brush his trousers and put it in his pocket for tomorrow. Demand for radio sets boomed. Parliament would even close their sessions early to hear him. He was our first radio star. He helped spawn an entire industry. In London, Arthur Burroughs is still fuming at Marconi House, but demand for radio has never been greater. So he applies for a second licence, for a London station. Let's do this radio thing properly. 2LO in London is granted that licence, and Burroughs isn't taking any chances. He will be the primary broadcaster. 2LO Marconi House, London, calling. Poetry readings, sports commentary. In fact, there's an opening night boxing match, although, unfortunately, it's a knockout in under a minute. And the first royal broadcaster talked to boy scouts by the Prince of Wales. Peter Eckersley. Sport and royalty. Obviously the essential foundations for any British broadcasting service. Mind you, Auntie BBC had not even yet been born. Later in the summer there are garden party concerts. As Burroughs is a publicity and demonstration man, many of these broadcast concerts are for private institutions and charity events. A chance to show what broadcasting can do. We were anxious to know whether the government would permit firms like ours to exploit broadcasting here as in America, where scores of commercial stations had popped up like mushrooms. Other wireless manufacturers, other than Marconi's, also expressed an interest. They asked the Postmaster General for a licence to broadcast as well. What was the motive of these firms? They wanted to sell wireless sets to the general public. Obviously some regular and reasonably entertaining programmes to hear are a necessary carrot. So already we pass from the amateur experimenter to the notion of radio as entertainment. But there was, you see, nothing high-minded about it. It was a business proposition. Metropolitan Vickers in Manchester, for example, they want in, so the Postmaster General says, fine. Kenneth Wright is the engineer at Metrovic who gets the job of launching in Manchester. In those days we didn't know there was going to be a unified BBC And we, in the north, felt ourselves in competition with Marconi in the south. And uh, we were hoping, of course, we could put a kink in our wave or something to give us an advantage. Kenneth Wright continues at the Manchester station. Peter Eckersley continues in Rittle in Essex. Arthur Burroughs continues at the second Marconi station at London 2LO. But throughout this summer of 1922, Eckersley was mocking Burroughs. In fact, people write to Burroughs saying how much they enjoy his broadcasts on 2LO London. But could he stop broadcasting every Tuesday evening for the half hour that Eckersley's on? Because listeners want to hear Eckersley lampoon Burroughs. For instance... Arthur Burroughs would play the Westminster Chimes in the studio on a set of tubular bells. This is 18 months before Big Ben's chimes would be heard on the BBC. 
So Peter Eckersley outdoes Burroughs by finding all of the pots, pans, bottles and scrap metal he can, and he bashes it all with sticks. Messy chaos lampooning Burroughs. He loved it. Here's another, retold by Eckersley and Burroughs themselves, some 20 years apart. You see, both of their broadcasts would often close with a poem, and Arthur Burroughs had a particular favourite. Burroughs, dear Arthur Burroughs, the late Arthur Burroughs, great man, nice, charming person. He used, at the end of the, um, end of the Sunday programmes, he used to say, The night shall be filled with music, and the, the cares that beset the day shall silently fade away. Now, instead of relying upon a clever engineer to fade him out very gently, he walked backwards over the silent floor of the studio so that the last of way was lost in a mush. And uh, one time, a, a rather naughty and skipping friend of mine, he and I had a conspiracy in which we stretched a string across the studio behind Arthur Burroughs and, and uh, silently fade... <laughs> All through the spring and summer of 1922, each broadcast is still experimental. Official broadcasting hasn't quite begun yet, because no one knows if there is a future in this. In fact, the Marconi company largely thought all of this was one big advert to show consumers how easy wireless communication is, encourage them they should all pay Marconis to help them send point-to-point messages across the world to each other. But the radio bug grows. The press want in. The Daily Mail, who of course sponsored the Melba concert, they apply for a licence to set up their own Daily Mail radio station. But they are turned down. It would be too powerful for a newspaper to have a radio station. It only took Times Radio a hundred years. In Westminster, the Postmaster General is inundated by applications for pop-up radio stations. He just can't keep licensing all of them. What is this, America? The British government was cautious. Arthur Burroughs here. It was clear that broadcasting must be placed on a sound basis. In May 1922, the Postmaster General says to the wireless manufacturers, Look, I cannot have all of you setting up rival radio stations. Britain is too small to cope with you all. But he says, I will license one or maybe two companies. So get together, chat it through, work out how you can work together. And the government, as governments do, set up a committee. And all that summer and autumn of 22, they committed. And for a while, it does look like there will be two British broadcasting companies, a North and a South. Finally, after weeks and even months of meetings, primarily between the big six wireless firms, an agreement is struck. Here's a man who only arrives a little later in the year, John Reith. They should get together and evolve some cooperative method of running and managing broadcasting, which, after much negotiation and argument among themselves and with the post office, brought about the formation of the BBC. Now, you may wonder where Reith is in all this. Wasn't John Reith meant to be the fellow who started the thing? The Reithian principles and so on? Well, he arrives when the BBC is one month old. For now, in our story, he's leaving a factory management job in Scotland. He's settling down with his new wife, having moved on from a possibly gay affair with his best friend Charlie. And he's about to try a career in politics. He's never heard of broadcasting at this stage. But for those who have, in the summer of 1922... Parliament announces there will be one broadcasting company. It's made up of Marconi and Metrovic and Western Electric and General Electric and so on. Each will have one representative on the board of this BBC and then broadcasting can continue and they will all sell wireless radio sets and to fund the operation there'll be a licence fee. The name British Broadcasting Company is coined by one of the wireless manufacturer bosses in one of those meetings. He's called Frank Gill. He notes in a memo before the name Broadcasting Company, he adds the word British. A few lines down on the same piece of paper, he's the first to write the word pirates regarding those broadcasting without a licence. Time for an exhibition, a convention maybe. That autumn, at the Horticultural Hall in Westminster, there's the first all-British wireless exhibition and convention. You could browse some radio sets, and you could even hear some shows broadcast from Marconi House, including pianist Maurice Cole. It would be, I should think, in the autumn of 1922, and uh, in due course we fixed up that I should play it, I think, about half a dozen short, very short programmes for a very, very tiny fee. And these were to be specially transmitted to be received at the first All-British Radio Exhibition, I think that's what they called it, 
and uh, it was a great adventure to broadcast, of course. I remember one man coming up to tell me one day, we call them studio managers nowadays, I think they were balance and control or something in those days, came up and whispered in my ear while I was playing, oh, it's coming over very nicely. I was nearly put off, I nearly stopped at this point, you know. But there's one more hurdle to conquer, news. That takes some time to iron out with the press. Finally, it's agreed that us broadcasters will lease the news from them for a fee. And there'll be no daytime news. That ensures that readers still go and buy newspapers. The press and the broadcasters still have an uneasy relationship. So whenever you see newspapers having a pop at the BBC, know that the Daily Mail sponsored the first ever broadcast with Dame Melba. They were turned down for a radio station when they applied. And for years, they were annoyed with this radio upstart trying to steal their readers. With the starting pistol sounded, Arthur Burroughs gets his broadcasting dream. He's convinced his employer, the Marconi Company, that radio isn't just about sending messages to individuals, it's about reaching many listeners. Or better still, it's still about reaching individuals, just lots of them. Flash forward to Terry Wogan's sad goodbye from his Radio 2 breakfast show. It's a beautiful speech. Thank you for being my friend, he says. Singular. Friend. Radio, even podcasts like this, still speak to one listener at a time. I make a connection with you. Arthur Burroughs and Peter Eckersley were among the first to realise that. But which of them would launch or join the BBC? The wild, unpredictable Eckersley, who created demand for radio and was still mocking Burroughs in his field hut in an Essex village? Or the straight-laced Arthur Burroughs, who's prophesied broadcasting for years? I think we know the answer to that one. Playing it safe, the Marconi company kept 2LO as part of this new British broadcasting company, as well as 2ZY in Manchester under Metrovic, a new station in Birmingham called 5IT run by Western Electric. Marconi's would also build new stations around the country. In Newcastle, Cardiff, Glasgow and more, growing in reach and ambition, filling the land with radio. But it starts in London on November the 14th, 1922, with a souped-up transmitter to reach even further. Rebuilt by good old Captain Round. Remember him? The Marconi whiz who helped start it all. Arthur Burroughs is before the mic, achieving his ambition to see broadcasting come to fruition. There are no recordings of that first broadcast, but we recreated it. Hello, hello. This is 2LO calling. This evening's broadcast will consist of a weather report, followed by a news bulletin, which will be read, first at a standard speed. It will then be repeated at a slower speed. It may be the case that I will read too slowly for people to remember the context. Thus, the British Broadcasting Company came into being. There was no precedent, no store of experience to be tapped, no staff ready to hand with metal proved in a similar field. It was all left to us. The next day, the Birmingham station 5IT launches. Terrible night. We had great difficulty in convincing them that they mustn't shout into the thing. They felt it was a sort of telephone they were using, you see. And the same with singing. They had to remember that they were not singing to the audience up in the back row of the gallery, but literally were talking and singing to them in their homes. They quickly bring in the first regular children's presenters, Uncle Edgar and Uncle Tom. I've been thinking about a few items, especially for youngsters, round about their bedtime. An hour after they launch, Manchester 2ZY starts under the BBC banner, with more children's programming there, plus an early home for an in-house BBC orchestra. Day three of the BBC had the first proper BBC concert in London, recreated here by those who were there. Cecil Lewis introducing singer Leonard Hawke, then announcer Stanton Jeffries. A microphone of the type commonly used in public telephone boxes was suspended in front of each performer. We have one of those old microphones here, and we also have with us the first singer whose name appears in such records as exist of our early programmes. So here's an impression of what it sounded like to listeners at that time. We had a habit of holding up the programmes to move pianos and microphones about. When the jobs go out for this new BBC, bizarrely after it's actually launched, 
There are just four employees hired before the end of the year. Burroughs is first. He's a shoo-in for Director of Programmes. John Reith applies for general managership, having tried a bit of politics, but he's been pointed towards the BBC advert by his MP boss. On arriving, one of the first things that Reith says is, so what is broadcasting? He really doesn't have a clue at this point. But of course, in time, he will navigate the company through choppy waters. There's the first BBC Christmas. It is my privilege, by the aid of the wizardry of Mr Marconi in this wonderful house, to speak, as I understand, to many thousands of people. Surely no man has ever proclaimed the gospel from such an extraordinary pulpit as I am now occupying. And New Year. To be the last in the year 1922 to speak to you is a responsibility before which the most confident might quake. As for Peter Eckersley, he continues at 2MT in Rittle every Tuesday evening in January 1923. That's the only non-BBC station to share the airwaves with the Beeb until commercial pirate or, well, is Radio Luxembourg, but that's for a future episode. But Eckersley, too, is ultimately convinced to join the good ship BBC in the end. All it takes is an opera. Broadcast live from the Royal Opera House in January 1923, three months into the BBC's life, to one of the first outside broadcasts. And, of course, we started to listen. Well, the lucky people were able to um, put a microphone into the opera, into the Scotland Garden. And all at once, one put on a pair of headphones and was aware that something miraculous was happening. Because you suddenly were in the atmosphere of Scotland Garden. You suddenly were conscious that this was music, that this had potentialities. And it was from that moment, that the first hearing of those opera broadcasts that I personally suddenly felt, look, I want to be in broadcasting. This is something with a tremendous potential. John Reith convinces Peter Eckersley to stop his frivolous Tuesday show in Essex. Its time has come. Captain Eckersley came to get my view as to what he ought to do with Rittle. When I said I thought he ought to close it down, he said it was the first time anybody had made any categoric suggestion. And he was very grateful. He's offered a job instead as BBC's first chief engineer. And here, Eckersley prospers, giving us new technology, nationwide broadcasting, the world's first high-power long-wave transmitter at Daventry. He brings choice to the airwaves with a regional and national scheme. In fact, he predicts multi-channel cable television by quite some decades. Without Burroughs, without Eckersley, without Reith, British broadcasting would look very different. Broadcasting is a development with which the future must reckon, and reckon seriously. There's one other name among many that I'm particularly enthusiastic about, and that's Hilda Matheson. She's an ex-spy who becomes the first director of talks a few years in. She reinvents talk radio, gives us the basis for Radio 4 and speech radio, and indeed podcasting, you could argue, as we know it. She's a fascinating character, part of a love triangle with the poet Vita Sackville-West and Virginia Woolf. She's the only BBC employee allowed to bring a dog to work. And so much more. We will get to her as we unpack those first few years on the British Broadcasting Century podcast, including the pips, the proms, the radio times, everything else that you know and love or tolerate or loathe about British broadcasting today. That pioneer adventure was born in laughter, was nurtured in laughter and died in laughter. And I want to believe that if only people would see their jobs If only people would see their lives in terms of its humour, of its excitement, and that a job well done deserves laughter, not the solemnity of the pompous administrator on top of it. The thing that we do is a God-given thing, for heaven's sake, because it's creative, and it's fun, and it's exciting. So that's the story so far. And that's the end of this special. But do join me for the very next special of the British Broadcasting Century between seasons two and seasons three. That's what we're bringing you next time. What Marconi thought of broadcasting. This is an interview Popular Wireless magazine did with Senatore Marconi in early 1923. And it's quite fascinating to see what the inventor of wireless thought of this weird thing called broadcasting that he never quite predicted and which he really thought was an accidental offshoot of the fact that his wireless communication was a little bit leaky. That's all to come next time. Do subscribe, share, rate and review us if you haven't already. 
Find us on Facebook and Twitter. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can find us on patreon.com slash Paul Carenza or tip me a price of a cup of coffee at ko-fi.com. That's coffee.com slash Paul Carenza. It's all much appreciated and helps keep us doing what we're doing. So next episode, what Marconi thought of broadcasting with some special guests. Yes, some of you have contributed. We'll be having pop-up adverts of the day throughout the next podcast. How very exciting. Anyway, as this episode lands, it's the 99th birthday of the BBC. As you're listening to this, it's probably long past the 99th birthday of the BBC. But either way, happy centenary year to the British Broadcasting Company. Except, no, it's now called the British Broadcasting Corporation, which hasn't really turned 100, because that only started in 1927. Oh dear, this entire podcast is built on some wrong maths. How unfortunate. And so, well, our concert's ended, and as usual, CQ, yes, yes, the usual song. I know. And the last words from Peter Eckersley. This is how he closed down 2MT Riddle every Tuesday for nearly a year from February 1922. Dearest, the concert's ended, sad wells the heterodyne. You must soon switch off your valves, I must soon switch off mine. Right back and say you heard me, your distance and where and how. Hark for the engine's failing. Wow, 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 wow. Well, well. Good night, CQ. God bless you and keep you. I can't. God bless you. Good night. Good night. The British Broadcasting Century podcast is presented and produced by me, Paul Carenza. Original music is by Will Farmer. Do find us on Facebook and Twitter at BB Century, but you won't find us on the BBC website because we're nothing to do with the present-day BBC, do you hear? Any archive clips used are either public domain because they're so old, or they're from the BBC and you're used with their kind permission. BBC copyright content reproduced courtesy of the British Broadcasting Corporation. All rights are reserved. Do join us next time and keep informed, educated and entertained as the special continue next time with Marconi on the British Broadcasting Century. <laughs>